Well, hello out there, all you friends of FIU and of good writing in general. I'm Les Standiford. I'm the director of the creative writing program at FIU. I assume most of you who are tuned in know that already, but then again, this is a brave new world, so I'm not sure exactly who I'm talking to. For all the, those of you over in Moscow, by the way, I hope you enjoy your time with us uh, today. There is no election, so you can just sit quietly and, and listen. Uh, those uh, of you who have seen me introduce this program before know it's one of my favorites out of the year. It kicks off the year, and it couldn't be any more appropriate that the kickoff uh, is, uh, you, uh, is one in which you're going to hear from our own. Folks who have graduated at, uh, within the past year, everybody always gets a chance to come on. And uh, once you've published that first volume, you get a chance to come back for a second time. And uh, James May is taking advantage of that opportunity. I'm sad we can't all be gathered at Books and Books. It's such a wonderful afternoon. I know many of you are sad with me, but then on the other hand, uh, it's saved Natalie Hevelina and James May the price of a plane ticket, a very expensive plane ticket, or uh, one a plane ride they probably wouldn't have wanted to take. So there is that advantage to the virtual possibility. What you're getting a look at, literally, is, as I've said many times before, the literary future. And uh, if you think I'm exaggerating, the count now is right at 200 books published by our alums. And James' uh, new book is, is one of those. So that means of those other five readers, soon enough, they'll be joined, they'll be swelling the ranks given our statistics in the past. So this is a chance to get that first glance and uh, at the at the talent at the publishing success to come and uh, to get an, a look at uh, what James' book looks like. I know you want to pick one up. I think you can get it uh, at uh, Books and Books virtually. You can pick one up uh, following the reading. I hope you will. I can remember reading part of it uh, when he was in my class years ago and thinking, geez, I feel like I'm reading something that I could pick right up off the rack. So, and look, it's come to be. And I've worked with many of the others of you and I feel the same way about your work. So I'm happy that you're here. I'm happy that I get a chance to listen to you. And I'm happy that everybody else has this opportunity to join in even if it's only virtually. So well, with that, here's a toast. Everybody break a leg. Let's have a great afternoon. And I hope it's not too long before we're doing this in person. Thank you. Thanks, Les. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Julie Marie Wade. Um, I always used to say I'm the newest member of the creative writing faculty, and that's not true anymore. Richard Blanco is our newest member. Uh, this is the beginning of my ninth year at FIU, my eighth year uh, coordinating the series, and of course, our first year virtually hosting um, all of our writers on the Bay events in fall 2020, starting um, with this one. Um, we are so excited that we can bring you writers from um, our program in the past who are now um, spread out fairly far across the country. We have um, a reader from Idaho, a reader from Indiana, a reader from New York, and a few from South Florida today. Um, every person, all six alums who are here, will get 10 minutes on the virtual stage. Um, and I will have the privilege of introducing all of them to you. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start with um, our first reader alphabetically, uh, who is Natalie Havlina. And uh, please don't be alarmed. There may be a little delay as each reader is popped into the onto the stage, um, but but we are confident that it will work. So um, Natalie Havlina lives and teaches in her hometown of Boise, Idaho. She holds a Master of Fine Arts in Fiction from Florida International University and a Juris Doctor with a Certificate of Concentration in Environmental Law from the University of Maryland School of Law. Prior to her teaching career, Natalie represented environmental nonprofit organizations in federal litigation. 
So without further ado, Natalie, um, we'll see you hopefully shortly on the virtual stage. Hi, Julie, did you finish introducing me? I did, I did. I know there's a gap in time and sound. Well, a little gap, so I wasn't sure if you finished. So, hi everyone. This is, it's so exciting to see everyone's names popping up on the side and to be with you virtually, even if not in person. So, without further ado, I will get into my reading. I am going to read you a few excerpts from Embrace the Moon, which is the title short story from my thesis. And because there's only time for you to hear parts of it, um, I, I am reading it slightly out of order. It has a number of sections and each section has its own title. So without further ado, here is Embrace the Moon. And the first section is called Farewell to a Friend. Grandpa's ashes wouldn't blow away. Mom and Aunt Trish tried to scatter them in the big wheat field next to the barn taking turns dipping their hands into a small wooden box and pulling out what was left of my grandfather. They clutched him in handfuls, then loosened their grips so slowly that I could almost hear their fists creak as what looked like gray sand trickled out through their fingers. It caught on the heads of wheat, stuck to the stems, and stayed. We three grandkids watched from the edge of the field. They didn't ask if we wanted to touch our grandfather one last time. My cousins probably wouldn't have wanted to anyway. Chase wouldn't have risked staining his Beta Theta Pi t-shirt and Ella would have been too grossed out. But I needed to say goodbye. I was the one majoring in East Asian studies. I was the one who used to sit with grandpa in the den after dinner, listening to his stories, not caring if he slurred his words or repeated himself. His voice was always steady when he read me eighth century Chinese poetry. Our favorite was Li Po, a drunken wanderer who fell into a stream and drowned while trying to embrace the moon. Did that really happen? I asked Grandpa once. I mean, is it historical fact? Does it matter? He asked. If I had been spreading the ashes, I would have recited some Li Po for Grandpa, the same excerpts I read at the funeral. At least I told myself I would have. Watching mom and Aunt Trish, I could only remember a couple of the lines from Farewell to a Friend, and they echoed in my head over and over again. Here is the place to say goodbye. You'll drift like lonely thistle down. With floating cloud, you'll float away. Like parting day, I'll part from you. When the box of ashes was empty, mom and Aunt Trish went inside. I stayed outside with Chase and Ella, watching the sunset gild the dull, dark grains of ash until they glowed as if enchanted. We watched the glow fade and shadows flood the field. Chase sighed. Well, I guess that's it. He's gone. We still have his writing, I said. He'll always live in his writing. Yeah, said Chase, but I'm not in a hurry to read about how important the great Palouse earthworm was to the culture of the first Americans, or whatever that last article he wrote was about. She means his journals, doofus. Ella rolled her eyes the way only a middle schooler can. Then she turned to me. They aren't on their shelf in the den though. Do you have them? The Long War. Grandpa was a historian, a professor at Washington State University. He lived on the old family farm on the Paulus Prairie, now converted back to native plants under the Conservation Reserve Program. Growing up there, Grandpa explored the rock piles where generations of farmers had discarded unwanted possessions along with the stones that once blocked their fields. He found treasures of rusted hammers, broken pots, and the occasional arrowhead. In school, he discovered Lewis and Clark reading and rereading their journals until he could plot out their route across the West on the kitchen table using forks, napkins, and serving dishes. It was because of Lewis and Clark that he started keeping a journal himself after World War II although his entries were sporadic. It wasn't Lewis and Clark Dr Grandpa talked about though, not after the first sip of whiskey. It was China. After World War II, before Mao closed China's borders, Grandpa didn't come home straight away. From France, he escaped east until he lost himself in a country bounded by mountains and a great wall. He walked the wall, passing days and nights without sleep, 
watching the moon and listening to ghosts, immersing himself in the echoes of their laments for China's slain soldiers. He felt history seeping up through the stones and into his feet, a presence as massive and vital as the forces the wall had been built to withstand. That was when he realized, he told me decades later, that what he'd been taught to call American history, Columbus and Manifest Destiny, the 13 colonies in the Civil War, all of it was nothing. A 10 by 20 inch aquarium enclosing miniature plastic plants and a few fish compared to the ocean of China's past. Grandpa walked the wall alone until one night, Li Po arrived, a presence in the wind. He confided poetry, told Grandpa the story of the elegy, the long war. Where other men plow, Li said, the Huns had killed. From ancient times, they plowed the fields, cultivating white bones and yellow ashes. Li Po and my grandfather walked the wall together, looking down at the ashen bone fields. They looked down on desert weeds varnished with moonlight and the stain of soldiers' blood. They stood in the light of beacon fire still burning and watched the shadows of dead soldiers' intestines flapping on the ghosts of lifeless trees. The beacons still burn, Lee said, because the emperor built the wall in vain. The beacon fires keep on burning. The war will never cease. On a picture screen, Grandpa's ashes lingered. They fell from the pages of books and tumbled downstairs. They carpeted the floor, shifting under our feet, recording our every step. They gathered on the kitchen table and crept into filed folders, smudging yellowed bank statements, creased bills, our crumpled copy of Grandpa's will. They stained my hands, tickled Ella's throat, scratched Aunt Trisha's eyes, and nestled in my mother's hair. Only Chase seemed unaffected. None of us mentioned the ash as if, with our silence, we could disbelieve it out of existence. The day after mom and Aunt Trish gave grandpa to the wheat field, Aunt Trish came back from a trip to town with three rolls of duct tape, black, neon green, and early 90s pink. She put the black on stuff to be trashed or donated, took the green to mark what she wanted, and left the pink for mom. They granted grandpa's possessions, everything from his blue down jacket to the old steamer trunk in the den where he stored kindling. They even marked the wood stove and it was still attached to the wall. The only things that weren't marked were the journals. Those were still, as Chase put it, missing in, in an action. Passing the temple of gathered fragrance. I wasn't the only one grandpa told about China, but I was the only one who liked to listen. When Chase used to ask him about the war, Grandpa would skip ahead to China. When Mom said she'd like to go to Paris someday, Grandpa said he'd rather go back to China. Aunt Trish liked to point out that there's no Chinese blood in our ancestry. Grandpa would ask her if that mattered, then remind her of the thousands of Chinese who immigrated here in the 1800s. At one point, there were almost twice as many Chinese miners here as white. So you never know, we could have an ancestor back there somewhere. One morning when I was about 12, Aunt Trish told me that I shouldn't encourage him to go on about this China business. All of us were at the farm for our annual summer visit and Aunt Trish and I were alone at the breakfast table. That country is a disgusting mess, she said. They burn so much coal, they get lung cancer from the air before they can get it from chain smoking. And there's so many people, there's no room to move. How do you know? I asked, you've never been there. If you would pay attention during social studies instead of, Aunt Trish stopped as Grandpa walked in. She smiled. Hi, Dad. Morning, Peaches. Grandpa kissed Aunt Trish on top of her head and winked at me. Morning, Abigail. I scowled. Aunt Trish says China is a disgusting mess. I expected Grandpa to defend China, to extol its mountains and rivers, its jasmine and cranes, the way he did when he talked to me. Instead, he squeezed behind Aunt Trisha's chair to get to the coffee pot and poured himself a cup. He took a sip, then said, the sound of the welling spring is caught in the throne of the stony stream. Aunt Trish sighed, honestly, dad. Grandpa poured a splash of liquid from his pocket flask into his coffee. Then he winked at me again before going outside to smoke. Later, after I spent an hour looking through grandpa's books, 
I found the passage he'd quoted in an anthology of Tang poets. It wasn't Li Po, after all, but Wang Wei. Reading that poem, passing the temple of gathered fragrance for the first time was one of those life-changing moments you don't recognize until years later. That was when it stopped being about my love for grandpa or his love for Li Po or Li Po's love for the moon. That was when I fell in love with China. I understood too what grandpa had meant by quoting that specific poem in answer to Aunt Trisha's scorn. It was in the very next line of the poem. I sit in meditation, taming poison dragons. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, with the second introduction, um, our second reader today is Samantha Leon. Uh, Samantha earned her MFA in poetry from FIU in 2020. She was the 2019 Christopher F. Kelly Award winner and finalist in the 2019 So to Speak Poetry Contest. Her poetry and literary journalism have appeared in the Colorado Review, the Iowa Review, Tupelo Quarterly, Poets.org, and So to Speak, among others. Her creative nonfiction is also forthcoming in an anthology by Highlight Books. Samantha lives in Miami, where she is a B2B marketing professional. Uh, please help me welcome Samantha Leon. We're just building your excitement. I'm sorry you have to spend so much time just looking at me. Can you see me? Here she is. Hi. Hi, Sam. <laughs> nice to see you guys virtually, everybody. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Julie. Appreciate you. Of course. Um, okay, so I'm going to read a couple poems. Julie, we have 10 minutes, you said, right? About, okay, cool. So I'm going to read a couple poems. Um, the first one I'll read is nonfiction, actually, that's forthcoming in a highlight anthology. And the anthology um, concept is that we're imagining if Miami sinks um, into the ocean, what would we like to say about it? Um, if it's gone. So my poem is about, or my piece is about Biscayne Bay. It's called After Taking a Photo of Biscayne Bay. I won't tell you where two trees are keeping secret an inlet, where boulders are rife with fossilized shellfish and ones currently inhabited too. Won't tell you where the inlet opens like a throat into the guts of the mangroves, a thousand hands reaching into the raw earth. No. I won't geotag this photo when I post it to Instagram, leaving my spot vulnerable to maps or ways. I don't want his beauty to catch on to the crowds, scaring away all of my wonders as a result. More Dorito bags on the shore, more plastic bottles in the sand. I don't want anyone to startle the feeding manatees. Their smooth gray snouts popping leaves off hanging branches, their boat-like bodies suspended in a bed of rack. Schools of baby barracuda strut through the slow water like packs of wolves. Birds glide over the mangroves and take their time under the sun. Then, the meandering little blue heron, his beak plucking at the water's surface, a ripple. Surely, other spots have even more yachts blasting pitbull than mine and are probably plagued by the whir of jet skis and sneers of speedboats. Peacefully, the eagle ray glides along the plains of the ocean floor peeling up a corner of its white un underbelly to the sky, free. Okay. Um, I have time for probably two more poems, I think. So I will read one called, okay, it's about animals again. So I hope that's okay. Um, it's called A Brief History of Pigeons. It's a weird little poem about pigeons. Um, okay. So here we go. Under medieval moonlight, Akbar the Great leaves his dove coat. As he emerges, so does his flock of 10,000, moving with him like he's a notch on the earth's compass, 
and they a heaving dark cloud. Fantail, Scandaroon, Frillback, Cropper, Hen, Archangel, Trumpeters and Tumblers. Maximalist Victorian doves, bosomed and curled, patterned and pedigreed. Tesla's favorite girl beckons from the window. When she wanted me, all I had to do was wish and call her and she would come flying. She understood me and I understood her. Desperate scuttles of hunger, scorns of filthy or flying rats, surging toward a bench, flocks of silver snatch a slice of pizza. Nutritionless joy, lice-ridden parasitic beauty. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to read, um, I'll read a poem called April Anywhere. And I guess it's six baby poems because they're um, a series of haikus. I think I wrote this in Campbell's class. I'm sure I did. Okay, April Anywhere. Small misshapen leaves. The fig tree makes its escape from February. The blue-garbed postman makes the day's deliveries, gloved and ungreeted. The train rumbles by. Windows reveal the city. No passengers on. Flimsy radish tops do their best. No room for ambi ambition in this tiny planter. Worm-tunneled apples drop to the cold ground and still will be devoured. Dusk again. The old woman next door hoses the driveway. Okay, since I write short poems and I rush through my reading, I think I have time for one more. Um, and I will read a poem called Mapping Desire that is really fun, but I keep revising it over and over again. So it's like the 10th version of it and I'm still unsure about it. Uh, but here we go, here, this is the last poem I'll read. Um, Mapping desire, let's see. After breakfast, we, saw, we fall asleep in the sun, my shoulder revealing a set of bruises, mouth shaped. We want to eat what we love, and sometimes it's obvious. Sugary bread, fried chicken, cheesy noodles, milk chocolate, and sometimes the urge to squeeze and sink our teeth doesn't follow a linear target. Fuzzy pet, plump baby, lover's shoulder. Science calls it cute regression. Freaks call it odoxalagnia. Karma Sutra calls it lovemaking. And we call it Sunday morning together. We want to eat what we love. And this is how I know you love me. My skin mottled black, brown, green, and yellow like a bruised pear. Scientists propose this dash of aggression is meant to offset the onslaught of positivity triggered in the primal brain. We want to eat what we love, and some call it vampire play, or sadism, or masochism, or sadomasochism, depending on who likes to bite and who likes to be bitten. We want to eat what we love, but you don't need to bite to eat. Biting is of its own ceremony, gowned in lime, indigo, and juniper green. Eight ways to embrace and mark. No nourishment, just documentation. To say, someone was here. We want to eat what we love, and Kama Sutra names eight types of love bites. The hidden bite, the swollen bite, the point, the line of points, the coral and the jewel, the line of jewels, the broken cloud, and the biting of the boar. It instructs men on how to bite or not bite women, from certain parts of the land, as if desire could be mapped. Thanks, thanks for listening. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Our third reader today is Raina Lipkind. Uh, Raina completed her MFA in creative nonfiction this past spring. She teaches medical students at the University of Miami, albeit infrequently and, afar, and from afar these days after decades practicing emergency medicine. Most recently, Raina has been actively engaged, as I think some of the rest of us have too, in omphalo uh, better known as navel gazing. 
So please help me welcome um, to the virtual stage, Raina Lipkind, um, with your virtual applause. Hi. Hi, Raina. Can you see me? Yeah, you're there. Oh, great. OK, very nice to see everyone's names <laughs> and my other students that I enjoyed sharing the last three years with. I miss you all, and it's very nice to have this opportunity to get a chance to rejoin the group. I'm just going to read a short story um, in the uh, area of creative nonfiction. It is nonfiction, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, it's called Maldiction. A room in my house needed painting. A friend recommended her handyman. Since I knew since my friend knew him well, I foolishly paid him in advance the first day he came to paint. It was just before Christmas and I was in the holiday spirit. He begged, his rent money was late, he needed to buy gifts for his orphan nieces, he had to take his dog to the vet. When he showed up drunk or otherwise altered the following week, I thought better than to allow him in my house, never mind climb a ladder. I invited him to leave and not come back, but he hadn't yet painted the ceiling as we agreed. The ceiling was all mine. My friend responded to my inquiry if the handyman had ever showed up at her house drunk with utter disgust for my unfounded accusation, for my disrespect for a trustworthy working man and my general state of unhappiness. I think she might have a crush on this guy. I can no longer be friends with her. Her taste in men is atrocious and her defense of his behavior indefensible. My father always stressed the importance of increments, small steps leading to success, learning calculus, improving physical fitness, weight loss, baby steps. So when I looked at the ceiling, I thought, okay, one step at a time. First, remove the peeling paint from certain spots, patch the crack across the middle, then sand, and finally, a, a coat of paint, white paint. Actually, a pink-tinted paint that turns white after a quarter of an hour, made especially for ceilings so no spots are missed. One step at a time, I said to myself, go slow, be careful, don't fall off the ladder, or otherwise get injured successfully complete the task by myself. Day one as a painter was okay. I covered the floor with old newspapers and taped them together. I carried my old wooden ladder from the garage and scraped the peeling areas. Little flakes of paint got caught in my hair, but what did that matter? The old white paint and my hair matched. I patched with amazing stuff the helpful fellow at Home Depot recommended. It was fluffy and dried in seconds. I bought the pink to white paint. I got the roller and an extension pole to fit it on, a bright orange plastic roller pan and a new slanted paintbrush to paint the ceiling edges and around the ceiling fan. Painted slant, I smiled to myself. It only took two trips to Home Depot to collect the needed equipment. Day two started out pretty well until my cell phone rang. I was deep in thought and startled. I teetered a bit. My cell phone fell to, onto the newspaper covered terrazzo floor and the glass shattered. Then while hurrying down the ladder, I tipped the bucket of pink white paint and it also fell, covering my world like the Dutch boy paint ads from long ago. It cost me hundreds of dollars to replace the phone and of course, another trip to Home Depot for more paint. I spent the rest of the day cleaning the floor with innumerable rolls of paper towels. I ran out of garbage bags. By day three, I was incrementally improving my painting skills. Nothing fell and I had no ringing phone to distract me. I edged, I rolled, I finished, I thought. When all the paint was dried, all white, no pink, I noticed a thousand spots that were too lightly covered. The ceiling wasn't bare, just ugly. Up the ladder again I went, 
more painting, more waiting, more checking. I have new respect for Michelangelo. Just painting the Sistine Chapel flat white would have been a feat worthy of centuries of fame, never mind creating works of art complete with optical illusions as he did. While watching the paint dry, I thought about my grandmother. She had a curse for everything. May your feet be too big for your shoes. May your teeth fall out of your head. All sorts of unpleasant oaths. My back was aching and my eyes were unable to focus on the different intensities of white. My ego was crushed at my pathetic attempts to repair one small area of ceiling, considering the vastness of the Vatican splendor. I thought of a new curse. May your ceiling need painting. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Raina. You're welcome. We're all getting used to the lag time of being on a little longer. Thank you so much. Our fourth reader today is James L. May. James is the author of The Body Outside the Kremlin, a murder mystery set in an early Soviet prison camp and recently published by Delphinium Books. James holds an MFA from Florida International University along with a BA from Cornell. He grew up in New Jersey, has lived in Miami and New Orleans, and now resides in New York City. James's short fiction has appeared in Tiger Tale, and he has reviewed fiction for the Florida Book Review, Gulfstream Literary Magazine, and New Orleans Review. Please help me virtually welcome James Almay to the virtual stage. Hopefully. Thanks, Christina. Ah, oh, hello. Any luck? Hi, James. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. I've never met you in real life, but I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's all yours. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction, which uh, I did not actually hear, but I I'm certain it was great. Um, uh, and uh, thank thanks too to to Les for the the nice words about the my book, which is um, this is my first book. Uh, it has come out. It, it actually came out in January, which is the reason I'm I'm back here. Um, uh, Les was uh, on uh, my uh, thesis committee for that book, so thanks to him for that as well. And of course, uh, Lynn, I, I figure, is going to go and get a drink or something uh, while I read this because uh, she has read different versions of this book so many times. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really delighted to be back, um, even even in this remote form. Um, uh, I, I, sh I will be uh, brief, but there are a couple things I should say about the book. Um, I think it is. It's appearing backwards. So uh, if you can, if you can, in your imagination, switch that uh, as in a mirror, you will get an idea of what the book looks like. Uh, it's called *The Body Outside the Kremlin*, uh, and uh, it's a historical mystery. Um, I, I'll say. Usually, I have a, a longer spiel about the the history uh, bit, um, uh, but I'll, I'll make it short this time. Uh, it's set uh, in an early Soviet prison camp um, in 1926. Uh, it, at that time, the Soviet prison camp wasn't called the Gulag yet, but it's in the system that that would become the Gulag. Um, it's a camp that was known as Slan, which in in uh, uh, Russian means the northern camps of special significance. It also the acronym means elephant, which I always think is a really cool detail. Um, and uh, it's on an island called Solovetsky, also known as Solovki, uh, and it occupies the site of an old an old monastery, uh, centuries old, a very illustrious monastery. Um, you should know for the bit I'm going to read that it was run uh, by the secret police of the new the new communist state, uh, who were known as the Cheka, and you'll you'll hear a character referred to as the Czechist, and that just means he's a member of the Cheka. Um, so the Cheka ran it, but it was actually mostly the, all the work was done. There were only about 50 or 60 uh, actual members of the secret police 
stationed there at any one time. The work was done by prisoners. And they even did um, some strange things at this place, like uh, running a museum that uh, cared for and archived the monks' old treasures, including um, a bunch of icons. They had a very fine collection of icons. Uh, so that, that features in what I'm about to read and uh, in the book. Uh, so I should finally just say, apologize if there are Russian speakers or hearers in the, in the audience. I apologize for my Russian pronunciation. It's not very good. Uh, and, uh, oh, related to Russia, the body out uh, the title I said is the body outside the Kremlin. Uh, we're used to thinking of the Kremlin as the seat of the Russian government in Moscow, but actually in Russian, it's just a, a word meaning um, a sort of citadel or uh, enclosed uh, area within a city or a settlement. So my, the Kremlin in, in my book, it's like, so it's like, as the White House is for us, it's only a White House. The Kremlin in Moscow is only a Kremlin. Um, so the Kremlin in my book is the Kremlin of this old monastery. Okay, so more more history than probably you wanted or needed, but uh, I'll try to redeem that. <clears throat> Antonov's body lay curled up on the wharf like an ear. The legs with their knees drawn up to the belly, the bowed spine connected to the bent neck, they made the lobe and the outer volute, while the hands crabbed before his chest suggested ridges spiraling inward. His clothing and long hair, wet after being fished out of the water, had frozen to the stones of the quay. It was now past sunrise, turning into what, in October, we called a fine morning on Solovki. Gray clouds with the sun showing through at moments, a strong wind blowing in off the freezing sea to the west. On the south side of the bay, a shelf of ice had begun to creep out from the shore. The deeper water here by the quay was only cloudy. The wavelets lapped slow and slippery against the stone. The checkist had been gone for an hour or more, after a few cursory questions about whether I recognized the body, I did, and whether I knew how it had come to be floating in the bay, I didn't. He'd left me and guard Rezdolsky behind with strict instructions that I was neither to go anywhere nor to interfere with anything. Gradually, the little crowd had moved away as well, casting dubious looks in my direction. Now Rezdolsky stood a short distance from Antonov's corpse, arms crossed and the gun dangling off his shoulder only unbending from time to time in order to scratch his chest or beard and sniff his dirty fingernails. Antonov wore trousers, boots, and a sweater, but no coat or hat. The posture was rigor mortis. That much I knew from having had, in the Libyanka, an elderly cellmate whose expiration we only noticed when he failed to rouse himself to claim his share of soup. No, what shocked me about Antonov's corpse wasn't the posture, but the face. It was pink bright as if painted. Only the week before, he'd been explaining the polychrome technique to me. Medi the medieval artists who used it were not, he said, bound to slavishly imitate the colors they found in nature. Instead, they chose the pigments in obedience to whatever laws of sacred beauty tradition had revealed. Skin might be green or light blue, the sky, ochre, the ocean, black, the leaves of a tree, gray or gold. Now, with a magenta face, Antonov might as well have fallen victim to the technique himself. Where I stood at the end of the wharf, the bay lay between me and the southern portion of the Kremlin. He could have drawn a secant line across the irregular curve of the water's edge and connected me with the holy gates. Their portico was overlooked by a collection of windows in different shapes, a big dimmy loon, the squares of casements. Each opened into what had been the Annunciation Chapel, now the museum. Gennady Antonov wouldn't be returning to his workbench there. He'd remain on the quay, stuck to the ground with frozen hair and cloth until someone moved his body somewhere else. It always struck me that Antonov was the only person on Solovetsky who really belonged where he'd been placed, among the venerable paintings and pots of glaze. His quiet speaking voice came out of a tufted beard full of crooked teeth. He wore, always, an astrakhan hat and an expression of extreme mildness. Massings connected by thinnesses defined his body and face. Thick fingertips and knuckles on slender hands, bulbous nostrils on a long, narrow nose, bulging eyes beneath a fine brow. He'd moved smoothly, but unexpectedly, as though the air around him had a different consistency than it did for everyone else. I'd pinned certain hopes on Antonov, and now here he was, drowned, frozen, and magenta. 
The wind pulled at my cap and stung my ears. I yanked it back down onto my head as best I could and stomped my feet to keep warm. Sledges laden with timber had begun to arrive at the landing. The men dragged them in teams, uniform and small at this distance, but assuming odd angles as they strained forward over the muddy road. There was still no ship to receive their loads, presumably one of the camp's boats. The Gleb Balki, named after one of the bosses of the OGPU, was used to transport both prisoners and goods, and there were several smaller steamers as well, would be arriving later in the day to take the wood on board. By now, Razdolsky and I were the only ones standing at the end of the wharf with Antonov's body. Some of the sledge pullers stopped to look out at us before they unloaded at the other end. I had started to worry about my next meal. If I was still here when the time came for my platoon to line up at the steaming, steaming pot at the edge of the trees, Foma and the rest would simply divide my portion between them. That was still hours away, but the Czechists had departed for who knew where, to return who knew when. Some provision might be made for Rozdolsky, who'd been posted over the body as part of his work assignment, but I doubted he'd share with me. At least I'd saved a hunk of last night's bread in the lining of my jacket. I broke it in two, putting one of the pieces in my mouth. It lost its flavor almost immediately, but I chewed until the stuff mashed to paste between my teeth. Then I swallowed, slowly. You learn to make bread last. I'd started on the second piece when the tall shape of the checkist separated itself from the unloading activity at the other end of the quay. Next to him, someone propelled himself along with a cane. As they drew closer, the figure resolved into an old man with a large gray mustache. Though I couldn't place him, he looked familiar. Here he is, said the Czechist as they came to the body. Yes. With his cane, the old man gave Gennady Antonov a light, sad prod. Here he is. The identity, you see, is not the issue. The Czechist pulled a cigarette from a cheap northern manufactured packet and tapped it against one palm. But we have no coroner. Can you confirm drowning as the cause of death? Perhaps, said the old man, once I've examined him. Examine, then. The Czechist lit his cigarette and threw the wooden match away. You aren't bothered by its being an acquaintance, are you, Yakov Petrovich? I assumed this would be a professional matter for you. That was who the old man was, then. Antonov's cellmate, another denizen of the relatively privileged Company 10. Such relative differences were important. Even today, with the gulag governed by the famous principles of economic rationalization, which declare that every prisoner shall be fed only in proportion to his contribution to the NKVD's yearly production plan. Successful Zeks learn to ferret out inefficiencies, find ways to be rewarded with a full portion of calories for less than a full measure of work. The man who parlays his friendliness with the doctor into a position as a medic, or his schoolboy lessons in arithmetic into a job keeping the accounts, he is the one who lives. And you must understand, Slan was not yet the gulag. It was not rational, economically or otherwise. How much more plentiful then were the opportunities to find an advantageous arrangement? With the prisoners running and, indeed, systemizing their own prison, administrative positions that could be distributed as the spoils of patronage proliferated. Clerical obligations multiplied as men found ways for themselves and their friends to avoid being murdered by hard labor. The production plan still ruled the island. I suppose that during October of 1926, seven internees out of 10 coughed in Selavetsky's forests and fumbled dangerously with its frozen tools. But its reign was less complete than it would become in even five years time. After all, the idea of operating an internment camp on such a large scale was quite new. Our jailers were still working out how best to exploit us. Hence the companies like 10, which consisted, in the main, of prisoners taken up into Zalvetsky's bloated, bureaucratic, or slimmer, professional layers. To receive such a transfer was what all of us in quarantine's, quarantine's splintered cots dreamed of, all of us with any acumen or hope of making the necessary connections, anyway. If, by dint of demonstrated competence, ruthlessness, or willingness to butter up those with influence, you got the assignment, your ration would only be a little better than in the labor companies and you would enjoy no more freedom of movement. But at least your work could be done indoors without the risk of it leaving you sick or crippled. I couldn't recall where this Petrovich worked, but I'd met him once before. 
on the occasion the Czechist had been interrogating me about, in fact, when Antonov had brought me to their cell to collect the haddock and fragment of onion. It had been a brief encounter. I remembered his name only because it was slightly odd. Yakov Petrovich Petrovich. The surname was the same as the patronymic. He was the oldest man I'd seen in the camp, above 70 at least. The mustache occupied a thin, wrinkled face. In the same way, certain dilapidated squares are dominated by statues from before the revolution. I am observing the scene, said Petrovich. I am thinking. This is how a detective works. Basic investigative method. The Czechist laughed. My organ has its own investigative methods. He picked, a he picked a flake of tobacco from his mouth. And anyway, the body was found in the water. I doubt you'll learn much from its present situation. When was he found? This morning, early, between 4 and 4.30. The prisoner assigned to clean the administration building's third floor saw him floating. At first, we thought he was a swimmer. It drifted into the middle of the bay. A rowboat had to be sent. Petrovich nudged Gennady Antonov with his boot, then turned and registered Razdolsky and me. The eyes above his mustache were sunken, yes, red-rimmed and watery, certainly, but their blue irises scraped you bare. I nearly looked away when he turned them on me. What's he doing here? He said to the Czechist. He knew your cellmate. Yes, and? Someone had to identify the body. I know you, the old man said to me. I've seen you before. What are you called? Bogdanov? Bogolubov? Bogomolov, I said. Anatoly Bogomolov. Petrovich looked unsatisfied, but he shuffled back towards Antonov's corpse. At his side, he bent slowly down on one knee, leaning heavily on his cane and clicking his tongue. So, live or mortis present in the hands and face. He brushed a piece of hair back over Antonov's ear, breaking ice from it in the process. He was like this when they pulled him out. He was like this when they pulled him out? Stiff like this? Good. He muttered, half to the Czechist, half to himself. Submerged body floats curled up like so, head downward. Same as baby in mama's belly, so they tell me. You always find lividity in the hands and face. Cold water keeps the blood pink, you see. Otherwise, he'd look bruised. He shoved at Antonov's shoulder for a moment and got his under, other, hand, uh, other hand underneath the knee. But the body's position gave him trouble. He let it go. I need him on his back. Help him, Bogomolov, said the Czechist. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. It was good to e meet you. Our penultimate reader today is Frisia McKee. Frisia is the author of the poetry chapbook, How Distant the City, uh, which was published by Headmistress Press in 2018. Her words have appeared in Cream City Review, The Feminist Wire, Painted Bride Quarterly, Calyx, Gertrude, so to speak, Nimrod International Journal, and the Ms. Magazine blog. Frisia is a staff poetry book reviewer for South Florida Poetry Journal, and she now lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Welcome, Frisia. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a little delayed, I heard. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks to Julie, Les, the FIU fam, uh, Christina, Books and Books, everybody who made this reading. Hi to former students, friends, family. Um, Lily and I had the strange experience of our thesis defenses being the last time we were able to meet in person. Um, and then like after that FIU shut down and everything else shut down. Um, and then I just never left my house after that. Um, so probably like a lot of you, um, I've had to give myself writing assignments during the pandemic to stay writing. Um, and so every day in May, I wrote a high bun, which if you don't know, is a prose block with a haiku underneath. Um, and so these high bun were also epistolary. So they were in the form of letters and they were addressed to the palm tree behind my apartment because I wasn't leaving my house. Uh, so yes, the, the recipient of these letters is a tree. Um, and as the pandemic continued, this like high bun project turned into an elegiac project. Um, but I'm just gonna read you three pieces from the beginning. It'll be about eight minutes. Today, I walked farther from our home than I have gone in weeks. 
Perhaps humans have a troubled sense of home because we are mobile. The door of the pet store propped open, multiple grocery lots full of autos. Otherwise, I spent much of the day sitting behind a computer. On our kayak ride last night, we tallied every high branched iguana, then lost count. It wasn't until I walked for half an hour that I realized I hadn't actually seen anything. I wasn't looking. Even as I write to you tonight, I take small breaths and lose count. This afternoon, Rachel sent us a video of dolphins near Miami Beach, joyful in a big canal. You know, there's an ocean near here, Florida somewhere. When I watched Rachel's video, I shrieked in our living room how such a thing's alive in a world of so much fraud, or maybe the lies are localized, humans basking in our own slop, paddling, I depart so I can feel I remain control group, we emerged, reacting to the red lays atop the woodpecker. Panic is a shortened form of the word pandemic. The whole skin sack of letters on a diet, some elements thrown out shadow of linguistic reality. Here's a list of feelings. Anxiety associated with disappointing others, shame about lack of follow through, in group abandonment anxiety, personal abandonment anxiety, health anxiety, procrastination, fear of commitment. I'm wondering if these are human sensations solely or if a situation building up can evoke such sensations in you too, if you feel similarly. I know you were placed where you are. You had no say in the matter. At least I think that's true. Did you land here? Coconut floating down the canal? One day, the surface of the water was covered in pollen, sunny, dusty, sheen. There were oil slicks for a few weeks and my girlfriend tried to determine their origin. If she had thrown her hat in, we would have learned that the dead end swirls back the way it comes. All the while, you never went to sleep. You never stopped your gentle people's movement. Then kayakers determined to paddle each cranny of this watershed, this system, meat, plants, sewage, pipe, leaks. When my dad and I drove across Nebraska last summer, I almost threw up when I saw thousands of cattle crowded together waiting for slaughter. Even from the highway, we could see the places designated for animal death, teeming mud corrals. Hey, I'm not the type to evangelize, but I have been trying to be more careful about what I eat since then. I suppose we absorb our environment, whether we like it or not. And what if all that talk in the pandemic, when we knew we were going to stay home for a while, the message came through loud and clear, don't gain weight, don't eat too much during this time of panic. Do not let your panic become a pandemic. Hold it in. It's the same reason so many people don't wanna wear masks. The same dysfunctional American impulse that cordons off those cows. No room for feelings in the slaughterhouse. But you produce sugars to photosynthesize carbs to survive. There is no story about how you've held back on this, none that I've heard anyway. You reach down into what's available for full nourishment. 
This river has never frozen, but it's always being watched by a harsh branched neighbor. This will be the last one. Today, I ran circles in the parking lot. My friend happened to drive by. She pulled up to ask what I was doing. And I backed away from her open window because she wasn't wearing a mask. And then I sensed an expression of offense. My friend has the same first name as my mother and was born in the same decade, a proxy, but I backed away. What else was I supposed to do? Today is a question about proximity. The cat threw up on the bed and I wanted to sleep on the bed. The dog licked himself dry in his cage after we took him outside in the rain and he wouldn't piss because he doesn't like already wet ground. Our turtle slept under a canopy of leaves and I ate two pieces of cheese as I was cooking fried rice and making hummus in the blender. I was thinking about stepping backwards, misunderstood, care. And I am thinking about you rooted outside, you always subject to rain. There is no time when you are not pelted even with wind, the forces which are a part of you, so much silence. The sounds you make are leaves through air, coconut accelerating with a large thud, all relational. In school, I was more interested in Newton's apple than his laws. The cat jumps from the bed and knows he will command the ground. The dog remains on the floor of his cage and we are sticky between our sheets. We don't even make a sound. The birds weren't quiet when we spoke. We weren't quiet like the animals. Thank you. Thank you, Frisia. Our final reader today is Lily Starr. Lily earned her MFA in poetry from Florida International University in May of 2020. Originally from Cecil County, Maryland, her poetry and creative nonfiction explore rural spaces in America, absurdism, and a sense of fantastic imagination. Lily's work has been featured in numerous magazines and journals, including Muzzle Magazine, The Journal, Electric Literature, Small Orange, and Fugue. Please help me welcome to the virtual stage, Lily Starr. Hi, everyone. Hi, Julie. Hi. It's so nice to see you. Good to see you. Oh, my gosh. What Fre when Frisia said after our thesis defense, it was like the last time so many of us were together in person. It's hard to think that that was a few months ago now. Unfortunately, I have not been as good as Frisia about forcing myself to write during quarantine. And hopefully some of you feel me on that. Um, but I, so I apologize if some of this material you guys have heard before, but I'm gonna read um, an excerpt from my nonfiction hybrid piece that was published in Fugue. Uh, back in May, I believe, and then I'll read uh, one poem that didn't quite make it into the thesis and then a new poem as well. Okay. What's happening south of heaven is the title of the nonfiction. The stories your mother tells you float in your memory like glass bubbles on the surface of a still pool, uninhibited by time or lineation. 17 boyfriends, but no idea which came before which. Have you ever seen your mother's birth certificate? What year was she really born? Break the glass on one lie and make a whole life dangerous. I don't yet know all my wars and how to name them. The neighbor who comes to cry to our horses at night feeds them apple slices. She prays for her sons. 
Your mother greets you standardly, pinch on the widest part of your arm, short embrace. She walks through the field, the yellow shine of buttercups on her ankles. Do you like the taste of butter? She holds a flower to the underside of your neck, your chin in her hand. She twists your head to the side. Sure you do, you're getting fat. Your mother doesn't know what it means to hold back. Your mother has at least 19 past lives. She likes her money where her mouth is, knows what she wants. Strong woman, independent woman, life of the party. The grass grows to kiss her feet. You do not push her hands away. You stand just as you have stood before at the bottom of the hill with your face in your mother's hand and buttercups in the grass and somewhere in another state, her lover is in rehab doing well without her. When your mother asks where you're going and will not accept out as an answer, tell her you'll be just a little south of heaven. Your mother walks up the hill where the buttercups grow. A cardboard replica of your body is glued to the sky. She answers a question that wasn't asked. She looks into your cardboard eyes, your cardboard smile. I've been praying for you, she says. God hears my prayers. I have seen how you change hour to hour like the sun. All of my prayers have been offered to a night that wasn't listening. The dark absorbs so many words. More secrets than the day, which stays zipped in light. This is how the sky grows. My mother has a thing for Ty Dolla Sign. I know this is absurd, but hear me out. I think these bitches trying to set me up. Maybe I'm just paranoid. Your mother thinks her lover has a private investigator following her. Or maybe his ex-wife has a private investigator following her. She thinks this because the man parked in front of our house last Wednesday did not wave back to her when she drove past him. She says he looks suspicious. I say he was probably lost. She says, aren't we all? You see, everyone is amused to someone. You ask your mother what she would want you to do if she died. Absolutely nothing. She says you are old enough now to take care of yourself and you try but she still pays the phone bill, the car insurance. She pays your bills and she goes out dancing and she doesn't know what shame is. She drinks and drives and it worries you, doesn't it? She could die. She could die on the way home from dropping the bartender off. She could die under a horse. She could die for no reason at all. Your cardboard cutout watches her, eyes persistently open. You sometimes wish you could quit seeing. On the other hand, you know your own death will be fantastic. What a good dead body. What a cute pile of ash. What an exceptionally sexy ghost. Heartache lives inside of you like a stone you have to pass. You will want to see a doctor about this. You will want to drink alone. You will want to go to the art museum and pretend to look melancholy in photos. You will want to show everyone these photos for proof you were here and you wanted more. Heartache can be passed down. Ask anyone. Okay. It's so strange to not hear a reaction in person from an audience and to just move on. I'm assuming everyone can hear me and that it's all good. Um, okay. Uh, the first poem is called On a Late Flight into Atlanta We Pass. And I wrote this in Richard Blanco's class this past spring. On a late flight into Atlanta, we pass over Tuscaloosa where I know you are. I look out the face-sized window and down through the skylight into your kitchen. I see you cooking dinner, mashed potatoes and green, green vegetables crisped beyond their point of doneness. I smell them at 34,000 feet in the air. A man in the row before mine says to his wife, if I slept with another woman, you'd smell it on me. When you and I were naked together, I smelled nothing but my own sex. This is how I knew you loved me, or this is how I knew you were faithful. Your skin hugging your body tight as a dress. My body, the coffin you lay your body inside. 
I see you dancing by the stove. And then I'm there beside you, slicing the heads of Brussels sprouts in half and coating them in viscous oil and salt, salt, salt. Give me your mouth. Does it need anything? The grinder cracking like a spine in my hands. There's never been enough flavor between us, but I can still taste you, feel you, whip sour cream into soft yellow potatoes. Give me your mouth again. And then you stand faceless as the night which surrounds the plain, faceless as the air that carries me away from you. And this last poem is new. Um, and I'm hoping to eventually, this is a first draft, so I'm really exposing myself here, but to eventually turn it into a villanelle. So if anyone wants to volunteer and help me with that, that would be great. All right. The day you died was a beautiful day. The yard, a painting of the English countryside, bees circling bright flowers. The day you died, my mother felt no pain in her lower back as she watched you under the fists of the attending doctor, pushing your chest back into itself, hoping your heart would recognize through force. The day you died, I masturbated four times but only came twice. The day you died, I cleaned my bathroom for the first time in months. Would it be wrong to say I had a fine day the day that you died? When your breathing stopped, I was probably unclogging my drain, all the dead hair and skin I've lost to water. The day you died, my mother said, fuck the laws. I'm not getting a damn permit to spread my father's ashes in the bay. I imagine us on that boat, your body falling off the bow in a cloud of black as though we are spreading darkness itself. And you will return to salt as I have returned to the drain the next week pulling out the cover of a razor, which has stopped all spiraling. It was a beautiful day when you died. A day of pretending we didn't see it coming, but I know that you did because for once you apologized, said the word love and complied with the doctor's orders. If I could ask you one thing, what does it take to live a life full of resistance? And when did it begin to hurt when they said your name? Thank you so much for your time and for listening. And hopefully we can see each other in person soon. Thank you, Lily. Um, that was our first ever and maybe hopefully our last ever virtual alumni reading. But one way or another, we will be back next fall for this event. Um, we're so grateful to all six of our readers and to Books and Books, um, especially to Christina Nosti, who made this event possible and is making so many other virtual events possible. Um, so if you're not yet in the habit of visiting the Books and Books author, virtual author page or ordering books from Books and Books, we highly recommend you check them out. Um, this reading will also be made available um, as all the virtual author events from Books and Books are. Um, so follow up on that if you'd like to watch a recording or share it with someone else who was able to attend today. And of course, thank you to you. Um, I can't see you, but I know you're there and I can see you in the chat, some of you. So thank you for tuning in. Um, I'd like to ask you before we go, if you could save the date for our two other Writers on the Bay events of fall 2020. Um, these will also be virtual, um, which means as Les pointed out, the upside is that no matter where you are, you are welcome to join us. Um, the next event uh, will be on Thursday, October 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we have a, a double feature. We have the poets Major Jackson and Dee Dee Jackson both reading starting at 8 p.m. So if you have classes at FIU, those should be done by 7.40 p.m. Should give you a little time. Um, these will be hosted on FIU Zoom. And so our newsletter and our Facebook page um, will be posting information about how to sign up for them shortly. Um, and the second, actually the third event of the season, but the second FIU hosted event uh, will be on Thursday, November 19th at 8 p.m., also Eastern time, of course. Um, and our visiting poet for that event, our virtual poet will be Rachel McKibbins. Um, so we're super excited for all three of these poets to be here with us, um, albeit virtually. Um, so please save the date and watch for follow-ups from the newsletter and the Facebook page. Thanks everyone. See you next month, hopefully.